It's week five of 2021. I'm Smitha Nair. This is your weekly fix. In December last year, activist lawyer Sudha Bharadwaj was released on bail. Bharadwaj is one of a group of 16 activists, academics, lawyers and writers who've spent three years behind bars in what is known as the Bhima Koregaon case. The National Investigation Agency has alleged that Bharadwaj and others were part of a conspiracy to incite violence at the Bhima Koregaon War Memorial near Pune on the 1st of January 2018. In February last year, the Washington Post reported that an American digital forensics firm found that key evidence against the activists and intellectuals arrested was planted using malware on a laptop seized by the police. The malware was used to infiltrate a laptop belonging to activist Rona Wilson before his arrest and deposited at least 10 incriminating letters on his computer. The Pune police used letters it found on the laptop as its primary evidence in the charge sheet they filed in the Pima Koregaon case. Of course, the NIA later took over the case. Months later, the forensics firm alleged that evidence, mostly in the form of incriminating letters, was also planted on the laptop of another accused, Surendra Gardling, using malware Netwire. The continued imprisonment of the activists and academicians in the Bhima Koregaon case, based on allegedly flimsy evidence, has been criticized by members of civil society. What's the status of the case? The trial is yet to begin. Lawyers for the accused have stated that the purpose of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA, was not to convict, but to keep in jail as long as possible those held under provisions of the Act. Ms. Bhatwaj was worked for and among the most marginalized people in Chhattisgarh for nearly three decades, is joining us in a moment. Her bail conditions stipulate that she cannot talk about the Bhima Koregaon case. Thank you for joining us on the Scroll podcast. Ms. Bhatwaj, how are you doing? Yes, well, of course, uh, after so many years, uh, to be able to uh, talk to friends and see friends and uh, not having police people on either side of you and yes. uh, be able to have a you know bath in privacy <laughs> and get up whenever you want to get up. So yes, freedom uh, has been wonderful. Uh, but um, yes, my uh, uh, I, I'm you know the, I, I do feel that the uh, freedom is a little limited, restricted because uh, I'm not permitted to leave Mumbai. So the area of my work, which is Chhattisgarh, mm. uh, where for the last thirty years I've been working, uh, mm. I'm not able to uh, go there. Um, and uh, Mumbai for me is a alien city uh, and uh, quite an expensive city. Hmm. Uh, I have to consider how I will uh, earn and where I will live and so on. My uh, friends, my daughter, my uh, organizations where I've been working uh, are all very far away from here. But at the same time, I do find uh, Mumbai to be uh, uh, a very efficient and uh, hardworking city. I mean, yes. it's, a, it's, it's a city of, of uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, people on the move, people, people working. So I do feel that something will happen. Okay. And uh, as I have come out of jail, I have come out with uh, lots of requests from prisoners. Uh, I do hope that soon I'll be able to help them a little bit and uh, also maybe do a few labor cases, etc. But yes, I'm I'm in the process of of settling down. I also have been given three months time to uh, get together my sureties. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying to complete that process also at the earliest. So yes, at the moment I'm I've been staying with friends. I hope that in a short while, uh, in a month or so, I should be able to move to uh, my own place. Okay. Um, during the period of your incarceration, were you keeping abreast of what was happening in the outside world in the country? Is there something that particularly bothered you, made you sad or angry, uh, or alternately gave you a sense of hope? Yes, well, um, I, as people who have, you know, as social activists who have al always been very tuned into what is happening, right. uh, jail is a place uh, where you do feel cut off. 
but uh, fortunately for us except for a short period during the lockdown we subscribed to and were permitted newspapers and uh, i can assure you we used to read the indian express and the hindu from uh, you know sort of uh, cover to cover sort of <laughs> uh, nothing would be left out including the cartoons and puzzles okay. so um and uh, though we did uh, in baikala at least uh, not in yarwada but in baikala we had a tv set in our barrack tv uh, tv in our barracks of course there used to be a lot of fighting over the remote and mostly it would be tuned to quite idiotic serials rather than news <laughs> but uh, but there was still sometimes yes okay and if i can remember uh, one thing which gave me hope and one thing which made me uh, extremely sad uh one were the visuals of the migrant workers walking back in the lockdown right that was so frightening i mean just uh, lakhs of people just walking and you know uh, the auto drivers taking people in their families and people take families on thalas and walking and you know dying on the uh, on the railway tracks yes. and uh, you know walking thousands of kilometers to uh, Uh, that was that was really a a, a, a sight which uh, deeply saddened me i have always worked with workers and uh, the fact that these workers obviously did not could not even survive uh, even one month i mean they they literally within a, a week started walking out right uh, they could not even, you know they didn't have enough saving they didn't have a place of their own they didn't have enough uh, surplus to last them even that long that they have to take children and walk hmm. um on the other hand the, the the thing which gave me great hope was the farmers movement and it was always a, you know uh, uh, very interesting to watch uh, press conferences and the news that was going on uh, about them uh, yes so that was that was something of great hope uh ms bhagwaj i want you to tell us about your work with the labor movement uh but can you start at the beginning you were the daughter of two well known uh, economists what were your formative years like well uh my parents were both economists uh, professor krishna bharadwaj and professor ranganath bharadwaj both were economists uh and uh, uh they were in the uh, united states both doing post doctoral uh um, on post doctoral fellowships hmm. and i'm afraid i was an accident which happened which <laughs> which uh, hmm. you know uh, quite capsized their budget <laughs> because i think students were not very well paid in those days right um but i didn't stay in the us for long uh, uh, i i had an american passport that's true because of my birth um uh, we came back when i was about 1 uh, subsequently i went to the uk at the age of 4 with my mother Uh, that was uh, to cambridge uh, in england uh, that was because my my mother had got um, a fellowship to uh, work with pierre srafa the very uh, great economist uh, in cambridge okay. um, and uh, around that time my parents also separated so my memory more or less is uh, of being more with my mother hmm. uh, after the age of 4 so uh, between the ages of 4 to 11 i was uh, i was in england and uh, uh, so uh, as a as a child going to school uh, in prime uh, you know primary school in a uh, what here would be called a government school but there it was called a county primary school so i went to the newnham croft county primary school and um uh, one thing that i do remember was in the later years uh, racism had begun to uh, rear an ugly head in cambridge also okay uh, not, not as much as it was in london or other places because the student community was always a very mixed community um, there were there were people from asia there were people from africa there were people from uh, latin america so there there were people from everywhere mm. and i remember my mother's house used to be always a refuge for the indian students who were dying to have indian food so they would often come down but uh, by the time um, i was uh, a little older uh, i remember the, uh, the cambridge used to be a very safe place we used to keep our key under the doormat and uh, then uh, once or twice the key disappeared 
and uh, i remember getting you know coming home and uh, i used to open the door myself my mother would be busy uh, she would come later on and i remember answering the phone and getting some racist views hmm. and i think that's the point at which my mother also uh, made up her mind that she wanted to come back but but those were uh, those were very interesting uh, lovely days uh, but at the age of 11 uh, i think my mother was as determined as uh, as uh, i became later uh, to stay here so she came back right and um, uh, initially after um, doing uh, a stint at the delhi school of economics she finally went to jnu in 1972 to found the center for economic studies and planning which has become one of the very prestigious uh, departments uh, in jawaharlal nehru university right so my my childhood Uh, subsequent to that was mostly spent uh, in the jnu campus what i can remember uh, and that was a very exciting place to be in uh, because uh, the young students there would be forever debating and discussing and having you know seminars and exhibitions and uh, you know nukkad natak and uh, you know street plays and that kind of thing they for a for a child uh, they were it was a very interesting place to be hmm. and uh, most important thing was that all around there were these young people who were thinking uh, less about their career and more about the problems of the society the you know social uh, uh, evils which needed to be tackled and so on so i think that i imbibed at a very early age um what about iit kanpur what were those days like was it then you that you started to be drawn towards the labor movement well actually uh, while i was at iit i did uh, begin getting involved with various things um, uh, for example in while we were in kanpur i remember going uh, to unnao which is the neighboring district when it was flood hit and we went there to the uh, villages and uh, i remember i i i missed a mid semester examination because of that okay. <laughs> and uh, kanpur was a very very terribly competitive place and you had to be really on your toes to uh, maintain your uh, what they called cgpi mm-hmm. um, your you know your marks um, then i also got involved while i was there with the mess workers and uh, who had a quite a strong uh, union and also a cultural team so i think what drew, drew me to the labor movement uh, was actually the involvement that we began to have with construction workers Uh, when i used to come back in the holidays to jnu there used to be a group of jnu students mm. and there was a group of aims students i mean who was uh, uh, studying to be doctors or who were already doctors and some of them were uh, interning or uh, residents um, so we had a group and i remember just out uh, outside the jnu campus at the place where now there is the priya cinema or the siddhar uh, intercontinental okay uh, hotel and so on at that place there was a sort of low lying area and there that had been converted into a sort of camp for the construction workers it was surrounded by barbed wires and um, there was a huge i mean they were mostly from odisha uh, and from chatisgarh and uh, rajasthan i think so uh, and these were the uh, workers who had been called in during 19 uh, you know the 1982 asiad uh, to buy build you know uh stadia and flyovers and five star hotels etc etc mm. so i think as a as a team uh, we we used to go there and uh, the doctors were of course very useful they would sort of treat people for uh, minor illnesses and refer them to hospitals and uh, do first aid etc and we uh, the less useful ones of us would uh, at least gather around the children and try to teach them and so on mm. so i remember that uh, the, the, this particular camp we visited was an odia camp Uh, there was a friend of ours who was uh, odia and he started speaking to the construction workers there and they they described how they are you know totally bonded how their uh, wages uh, you know how their food which they eat is deducted from the wages and they don't have enough money to go home and they've had a death in the family and you know some of them are very sick with dysentery and so on and they want to go back but the thekedar is not giving them a ticket to go back so virtually they were bonded labor hmm. and the next round we i think we used to go three times a week or something next time we went the man was uh, was nowhere to be seen 
and i remember th thinking oh my god we you know we just asked him a question and look where it's landed him and the thought that you know these you know these appalling conditions of work of safety uh, you know are so intimately you know it, they they're very it's they're very structural problems it's not something that you know just a bit of charity or a bit of uh, you know being nice can help it's a very long struggle to you know get workers they do and so on so um, that was i think one big revelation for me okay and what did your mother or your family and friends say about the path you were headed on my mother felt uh worried about me because she uh, felt something and quite rightly so she felt that you know you are sort of giving up a very good academic career but you know have you thought what you will do there hmm. so i very idealistically said oh whatever they ask me to do hmm. so <laughs> so um, you know she said but you know it's very important to have as a woman to have an identity Uh, many of these spaces are very you know uh, patriarchal spaces and it's difficult for a woman to and and i i uh, i must uh, grant it to her that uh, it's not that she was wrong she was quite right hmm. but uh, the good thing was that in those times um we really, really as a generation we didn't have a choice of being in between you know we we hmm. didn't have a soft option of joining an ngo or something either you joined the movement or you were a professional hmm. so either you directly joined the trade union movement or workers you know farmers movement or whatever there was or the narmada movement or the bhopal gas pedit uh, movement you you either joined in with the people's movement or else you became a professional and assisted that movement or supported that movement as a journalist or a teacher or a doctor or whatever uh, this in between thing of you know maybe being in an ngo and continuing your middle class lifestyle while at the same time doing uh doing uh social work that option was not really very much there in those times and i'm glad because i think uh, at the age of 25 you're quite resilient you can you're capable of uh of uh, making adjustments and uh, i did that yes okay miss parfaj i was wondering if you could reflect on this uh why do you suppose the non working class in india has this Uh, deep contempt uh, or at least suspicion for the word union or, or trade union well you see i think one thing which people fail to uh, understand is that uh, you know it has been through a century of struggle that people have got the labor laws which they have right uh, bit by bit by bit by bit but it's actually a minuscule population of the working class who actually has the benefits of labor laws today or the protection of labor laws today now it is looking at these permanent workers who everywhere are in a minority today even if you go to manufacturing sector for example in the cement industry in the steel and in even in the public sector it will be less than 10% of the workers who are actually permanent hmm. the rest of them are all contract and casual labor and these permanent workers have it is true that uh, it's difficult to take them uh, take uh, to remove them from their positions uh, it is true that you know they have the protection of labor laws and so on and so forth it might even be true uh, like some people say ki nahi ye log kaam chori karte hain they are they are not diligent and so on and so forth uh, there's also a concept uh, which has come mostly because of the government sector that you know employees once you make them permanent they you know don't have an incentive they don't work hard enough and so on and so forth but the fact still remains that 80 to 90 and in the unorganized sector totally everybody and even in the organized or the industrial sector at least 80% of people are really working i mean themselves to the bone yes if that was not the truth why would you have had 10 million people walking in the lockdown right just think of that scene the people walking back from mumbai to bihar to uttar pradesh to chatisgarh i mean that meant that they did not even have uh, smita they did not even have 15 days of ration with them See. they didn't have a place they didn't have a bank balance they didn't have they didn't have uh, if they didn't work they could not survive you know so this underbelly which is there which is very much there is actually the the greatest proportion of your uh, working class 
and as far as the unorganized class uh, section is concerned they hardly have any labor laws to protect them uh, many sections just don't have any laws to protect them and uh, this makes up uh, maybe 93% of our total workforce so i think actually uh, first of all this allergy to the word union is partly because uh, partly stems from our uh, contempt for manual labor which is very much part of our caste culture of of india i mean uh, dirtying your hands is never a good thing hmm. a and b also that we see what we see as unionized are a very small slice of privileged workers who may be misusing the protections they have got but the fact of the matter is that the wealth of this country most of the wealth of this country 90% of the wealth of this country is being created by people who work in even today terrible appalling conditions and uh, i think a lot more unionization has to happen and the other thing which the middle class has to realize is that when it comes to them i mean doctors have been on strike the same thing can be said about them are yaar ye log doctor karne ki jagah patients you know it's corona time and they are going on strike the same thing can be said about teachers university teachers have been on strike uh you know so but why does that happen does a strike ever happen suddenly it usually happens over a long period of time when people's demands are not met not met all negotiations fail and then only people take up a step like going on strike and we have seen many of our middle class people do it now right um, i was hoping to focus on uh your role as a lawyer in chatisgarh uh talk us through the kinds of cases that you dealt with as a lawyer there there were many many cases i remember in janhit we had some 300 odd cases that we were handling uh, around the time when i was arrested um well one set of cases was normally the labor cases um you see in in janhit we had a policy that we do group legal aid Uh, rather than giving legal aid to an, to an individual which doesn't make such a big impact in society we preferred to actually give group legal aid to groups who we, we felt were struggling hmm. so whether it's a union or whether it's a commun- uh, you know a whole village is fighting against acquisition or uh, again for or they fighting against you know a mine which is coming up and causing environmental de- devastation um so these were the kind of sort of cases that i would do and when i went to the high court what i realized was that this is true not just for workers every single group of poor people in this country who wants to implement laws which have been uh, which give them rights hmm. whether it's forest rights or pisa uh, for the adivasis or whether it's land acquisition or you know for for the farmers they have to fight and fight to get those uh, laws implemented on the other hand while they are fighting the state charges with them of all kinds of offenses against their demonstrations against their leaders which are all criminal cases okay and the funny part is the criminal cases are very for- forcefully implemented the the uh, you know good laws which help to give you rights are very poorly implemented so when we saw this we started taking up janhit a group of lawyers started taking up cases and uh, i did uh, large number of land acquisition cases and anti mining cases and the and third category of cases which came to me uh, from 2007 onwards when i became active in the pucl were the cases of um, uh, adivasis of bastar uh, either who were implicated in false cases in false naxal cases or who were killed in fake encounters okay and two uh, cases in which i was also involved sarke guda uh, and edismita edismita not so much but sarke guda definitely uh, you know fortunately for us two very brave journalists had reported this particular encounter uh, both from the indian express and the hindu um uh, that you know actually it was not an encounter at all uh, it had been claimed that you know 17 maoists have been gunned down and so on actually they were all villagers they had all gathered for a beej pondum uh, ritual which is before the sowing uh, when it's decided uh, how the cultivation is to take place and how they're going to help each other and so on 
um, and uh, out of those killed eight were children okay. so uh, and these were all people with identity cards and village and, and of course totally unarmed um, so because of the bravery of those villagers a judicial inquiry was set up and i remember that you know for people speaking only gondi coming all the way to raipur to you know be cross examined by these very suave and uh, english speaking lawyers on the other side uh, was a very difficult thing and uh, i remember janhit gave the initial help which was then taken over by the jagdalpur legal aid group uh, it was when i was in jail that i got the happy news that in the judicial inquiry we actually won the case and the villagers were able to prove that it was indeed a fake encounter uh, have there been times in the last 3 years when you've regretted having taken on the role that you did in chatisgarh ever thought that the price you've had to pay was was, was too much and not worth it never <laughs> never uh, have i regretted it hmm. uh, the the only uh, small regret which i do have is that uh, in all this time when i was uh busy with the trade union movement and with my legal work and with my work with the pucl um i do feel that i had neglected uh, my my child my daughter mm. uh and in fact i was trying to make amends for that <laughs> when i came to delhi and uh, started teaching in the national law university at delhi Uh, because uh, that that was the time when uh, she was to go to college and uh, she was at a critical period in her studies and i wanted to uh, really be with her and help her uh, unfortunately i got arrested okay. so that also i was not able to give her but uh, otherwise i think that this kind of effort and 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 seriously i mean i'm asked this question from many people that you know did you consider it a sacrifice did you i didn't look upon it as that at all i think if we really believe in the constitution we have to bring the constitution to life uh you know for its for the poorest of the poor and this is the talisman gandhi ji gave us that you know look at the poorest person and think you know is it going to help hmm. and uh, i think uh, this is uh, something which uh, you know trying to really uh, bring about economic justice Uh, it's just it's not just a word in the preamble it has to be worked for and probably many many more people have to work for it hmm. so I, i i definitely don't 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 regret it no uh miss bagwan i i know bail provisions stipulate that you cannot talk about your own case but i was wondering if you could reflect on the use of uapa to clamp down on dissent against protesters and the particular bail provisions that seem to make it uh, so attractive for authoritarian administrations you know i think in fact the the father the the, the passing away of father stan swami um there has sparked a lot of debate regarding the uapa uh, and not just that i mean the the acquittal of akhil gogoi in the uapa the uh, comments made by the delhi high court in granting bail to natasha narwal and uh, iqbal tanha uh, uh, iqbal tanha and uh, devangana kalita uh there also the delhi high court is it so i think there's a lot of questioning going on uh, regarding the uap particularly its bail provisions now its bail provisions basically say that if there is a prima facie case then a judge is uh, virtually barred from granting bail now uh, yeah that, that that literally means that you can't grant bail at all uh i think this is a discreet you know bail no doubt bail uh, is discretionary in uh, in grave cases but then you have taken away the right of of, of granting the bail itself uh, by by a statute now that uh, really needs to be uh, looked at again that it it's a, that it is a draconian law and particularly its provisions regarding bail are draconian is something which i think is coming to the fore and uh, it would be good if the courts or the law commission would examine it one final question before we go i wonder if you've been able to watch any movies since your release and in particular have you been able to watch jay bhim and uh, what do you think oh uh-huh, it has uh, yes i i i very much enjoyed watching that uh, film i have had the good fortune actually to have met justice chandru yes um uh, in fact when uh, i used to sometimes go to the judicial academy at bhopal where uh, we would be invited to 
speak to the judges, uh, high court judges, uh, on various issues. Uh, many social activists and lawyers were invited to speak about these things. So I have gone uh, several times to talk about labor law or human rights or land acquisition or Adivasi rights and so on. So uh, on two or three occasions, I met Justice Chandru there. And uh, of course, uh, at uh, his present age, etc., he looks very gentle, but I'm sure he must have been quite a firebrand young lawyer as they showed in the, in the film. Okay. And uh, I think that film does a good job of showing, you know, what, what really a lawyer needs to do if they want to get justice. I, I very much like that film. Yes, I did. All right. Sudha Bhadwaj, thank you for having made the time for speaking to us here at Scroll. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to our listeners as well. I'll be back next Friday.